a little bit uh, brief to catch up the schedule. I'm not going to answer this uh, question, but I think it's a very interesting one. Uh, thanks to all my group members. I'll mention the contribution of the graduate students who I'll be speaking, and uh, crystal growth has been carried out by Shimon Cohen for many years, and the technology by Arkady Gavrilov. Thanks to the micro nano fabrication uh, utility here, who is actually sponsoring this event, and uh, had is Professor Neil Tesler, Chief Engineer Jakob Schneider, and there are many dedicated people working there and making our research uh, possible. That can only take place because of the existence of this uh, important center. So, insert letters are being used today as uh, activate as. Um, as active elements, as memory elements. The underlying uh, mechanism is uh, some manipulation of atoms in insulators by an electric fields or by the energy provided by the electric fields. In more detail, we could say that uh, there is, a, in most cases, an insulator to metal transition. A certain section or part of the insulator turns suddenly into a metal when an electric field is applied, or just a change in resistivity where we define a metal as a material in which the conductivity is still very high at uh, low temperatures. Examples are uh, metal atoms that can be ejected from the uh, electrodes, or oxygen atoms that can move around. Uh, we usually refer to them as oxygen vacancies that tend to dope the uh, insulator. <laughs> And uh, another important example is actually the atoms themselves. They, they can be uh, changed slightly, and uh, there's a phase transition induced. These are the phase uh, change memory uh, devices, which are fairly well advanced. So uh, why are these materials interesting and important? Firstly, because they're non-volatile, so can be used for uh, memory, non-volatile memory applications. That's our current application. And they're also very small. Uh, they can be, in principle, much smaller than an electron devices. So there's no reason the device can't be as small as uh, just a few atoms. Current status is that uh, memory chips are already available commercially. There are many announcements using different uh, technology, insulator technologies. Uh, research on uh, logic circuits using two terminal uh, devices is uh, being uh, carried out here by uh, Shachal Kavinsky, Avinom Kolodny, Uri Weiser, who are trying to integrate it with uh, the devices with CMOS to come up with uh, some more efficient uh, computers. They are using two terminal devices. Uh, device physics is interesting, device chemistry is interesting, not very well understood, so that, that's why it's a very good uh, topic for research in uh, universities. Um, I've seen only very few examples on three terminal devices, which are, to my opinion are necessary for logic. All of them are not really suitable for uh, as logic elements, and I think this is a wide open area of research. Uh, we are very pleased to host today Professor Dong Win Chen, who's sitting here. Uh, he's a founder of a company called 4DS, actually working on this uh, memory, one of the memory technologies using insulators. He'll be describing uh, his work on this subject today at the end of the conference. It was a little bit shifted now. I guess it will be about uh, 4 o'clock, uh, more or less. And he's also uh, talking today at um, 2.30 uh, at the 10th floor on entrepreneurship in China, a different topic. He's, uh, uh, well known for, so you're invited to both of his talks, and he'll be able to tell more about the applied and actually also the physics, he's a physicist, so he'll also be able to talk about the physics, low temperature physics of these devices. Uh, Professor Chen is now in the uh, Dean of the School of Interner Inter Entrepreneurship in, uh, in uh, Beijing University, and he was previously a Harvard professor for about uh, 15 years uh, before moving back to uh, China. So this is the agenda of uh, my talk. I'll be uh, pointing out the highlights of our research on insulator electronics, but I would l also like to uh, provide a brief uh, review of our activity on uh, conventionals, which are still the working horse of uh, electronics. Okay, we are working on resistor switching in hafnium oxide. Hafnium oxide is um, used in the silicon industry as a high-K gate insulator. It's very well known. It can be found in every silicon foundry. That's for, it's a very useful material for electronic application, but it also exhibits very nice uh, resistive uh, switching, as we'll see shortly. 
uh, the effect of uh, is, or resistive switching is uh, believed to be due to the formation of uh, enrapture of uh, metallic uh, oxygen vacancy filaments uh, in the material. So we're trying to understand actually what's going on inside the material. Um, that's typical uh, resistive switching uh, IV curve. We can see first that there was a high resistance state, HRS, then a set operation brings the material into the low resistance state. And going backwards to the uh, negative voltage, we are switching by a reset operation to the uh, uh, high resistance uh, state again. This is called the bipolar resistive switching. There is also unipolar resistive switching where everything is done at the same uh, polarity. And this is the, the way we think about the filaments. There are here is the two electrodes, the uh, hafnium uh, dioxide, and some oxygen filaments. And the qu main question we have in mind is actually what is the size of this filament? We think it's very small. It can be just a few vacancies that can make a difference between the high resistance state and the low resistance state. So, how many how many vacancies do we actually have to move in order to switch a device from uh, on to off? That's I think an interesting question. This is a standard bipolar transistor. We were working with bipolar transistors before starting this project on, uh, on um, insulating materials. We can see the emitter n-type, base p-type, and collector n-type. Uh, we're using uh, compound semiconductors to fabricate this transistor. This was a previous, previous field of our research. Now, if we take the emitter away, we can put, instead of the emitter, a thin uh, insulator, and now we have a uh, metal, insulator, semiconductor, bipolar transistor. And uh, we use it in order to study the uh, thin insulating layer. So when we apply a voltage, a oxygen vacancy metallic filament is generated. Uh, we can see the, uh, there is a small tunneling gap between the filament and the semiconductor. And our goal is to try and understand what's going on inside the small filament by looking at the transistor uh, characteristics. Okay, this is the band diagram of the device. We can see here this is the metallic filament. We just uh, look at it as a, as, a, as a conventional metal, the Fermi level. This is the insulating gap, a very small gap, which remains inside the uh, oxides, about one nanometer more or less. That's what we believe. This is a p-type p semiconductor, and this is the n-type semiconductor, just the p-injunction. The role of the pin junction is to separate uh, injection into the uh, electron injection injected into the valence band from electrons injected into the conduction band. So we can learn a little bit about the transport through the filament. So at low applied bias, electrons are just injected from the filament into the uh, valence band and measured as a base current, as a current at the p electrode of the uh, pin junction. And once the bias is uh, increased, we get some injection into the conduction band, and then we are getting the uh, collector current. So we know now electrons are injected at higher energy. That's the main uh, point here. Okay, this again, the band diagram combined with the actual physical device with, you can see the metal e electrode, the, uh, the tunneling gap, it's, sorry, the, the conducting filament, which is uh, again a metal. We don't know exactly how it looks, so it's a schematic view, the, the tunneling gap, we actually know that there is a tunneling gap. Not all people would agree to that. Also in the low resistance state, this is a p-type semiconductor, n-type semiconductor, and the uh, Venn diagram, we can measure separately the electron current at the collector contact and the uh, whole majority carry current at the base contact. This is how switching looked, is looking uh, when we're just looking at the base current, namely the majority carrier current. This is a, exactly the same as a, an MIM, metal insulator, metal structure would behave. Uh, this is the uh, set operation. We have to limit the current, otherwise we get a hard breakdown and the device cannot be recovered. And at negative bias, we can get to the high resistance state again. This is nothing new about this. We would get, get exactly the same characteristics if we would just uh, look at a uh, metal insulator, metal uh, two-terminal device. But now we do have a three terminal device. We can measure the uh, collector current. And we can see here that we are getting some collector current. Initially, there is no collector current. Then it comes up. And in some cases, collector current actually would be uh, larger than the uh, um, base current. So we, we can get a transistor gain. In principle, this could work as a good bipolar transistor. We see no good reason for it. But maybe someone would come up with a good reason to do that. Um, 
Okay, so here again, we can see that at uh, low bias, we just have base current, just majority carriers, same as MIM structure, metal insulator and metal structure. But at uh, higher bias, we are getting some collector current over here. And this collector current is due to thermal excitation of electrons from the metallic filament into the conduction band. So that's the main point here. We get a, meta, a thermal activated process, so we hope to get the temperature out of the collector current of the uh, um, IV curve of the collector current. That's our main goal. And that's how we are using this device presently, mainly. Um, this is what happened after a fairly complicated and rigorous analysis of the uh, collector current. We can extract the temperature in the filament. You can see here the color scale gives us the temperature. Uh, the base current is actually heating the device and the collector current, the um, majority, the minority carrier currents, lets us analyze the device and we, we can tell what the temperature is at each uh, uh, bias point. We can see fairly high temperatures uh, of the filament that are extracted uh, using this method. Uh, this is temperature is extract, extracted from this collector current in this region of the IV curve and this is actually causing the heat, the, the base current, which is much larger in, in, in this range. Okay, so um, we believe it's the only experimental method which is available nowadays to evaluate the filament temperature. We don't, we're not aware of any other methods, at least for oxygen, small oxygen filaments. Uh, thermal effects play a key role in switching mechanism. I think uh, it's quite well understood that the switching can only take place at high temperatures, so it's important to know what the temperatures actually are. And we uh, compare the thermal simulations with um, our measurements in order to extract some information on the geometry of the filament. That's what I'll be showing next. So here is the sum of the temperatures we have extracted as a function of the, the total current. We repeated the temperature also at low temperature just to make sure that we are uh, really measuring te temperature and not something else. We are expecting the temperature to be lower and this is actually the case. The extracted temperature is about uh, 300 degrees lower than the, uh, at, at 3K than at 300K. So uh, this made us uh, believe that our results are actually uh, correct and we are uh, co extracting the right temperature. Uh, we can extract high temperatures, we can extract low temperatures, actually showing that we are doing our job correctly. We can extract low temperature and the ambient temperature, when we're, or actually both ambient temperatures, using a different layer structure, which I'm not showing here. We are now working on this intermediate range to get the full uh, range of temperatures as a function of uh, power supply to the um, filament. Uh, these are the results of our thermal uh, simulations and actually we compare the thermal simulation with the uh, experiment and our main goal here was to try and evaluate the diameter of the filament. It turns out that uh, although these simulations are not very straightforward, there are many complications, but the result is quite robust to the diameter of the filament. So we're pretty sure that the diameter should be of about uh, one of the order of one, and one nanometer which means that there are only very several vacancies of the top of uh, this filament, which I think is quite uh, interesting. Thermal simulations by themselves are very uh, complex and there are several groups doing just that. Uh, some of the issues are that uh, where is the heat input? In our case, heat input is at the interfaces because most of the voltage is uh, applied uh, through the, um, across the tunneling gap. So uh, we actually have no jowl heating of the filament or mostly heating at the, at, the, at the interfaces, bottom and top interfaces. So we, this was our heat input in the simulations. Um, there is some temperature dependence of the thermal conductivity, which is not well known, and very important part, which I think is recognized by most group working on thermal simulations, that in nanomet nanometric di the dimensions, the uh, thermal interface resistance is very important, actually it determines the temperature rather the, than the bulk uh, properties of the uh, material. So uh, what are, what's better, filament or bulk? Uh, bulk can be more robust. We'll hear more about it this afternoon from uh, Professor Chen, but filaments are small, so I think it's an interesting question. What should we prefer? And uh, also 
for uh, robustness and repeatability of this uh, technology, whether filaments are really something we can depend upon and rely upon in, in uh, very large scale in integration. So that's all about our uh, insulative work. I would like to review a little bit our research on uh, semiconductors, which actually most of the group is uh, still doing. Um, one of the fields is very closely linked to industry. It's a very hot topic, gallium nitride electronics. Uh, both silicon foundries and more defense-oriented uh, foundries are interested in the subject. Uh, we are getting into it. Um, yes, I promised to mention names, so uh, Elam Yolon is doing the work on uh, uh, the uh, filaments in insulators. He's a student uh, in charge of most of the results, all of the results I've been showing. And uh, Shlomo Mehari is doing work on, uh, is working on the on gallium nitride. What we're trying to do here is actually to simulate current through the aluminum dioxide uh, gate insulator. Uh, we have got a quantum well here in the gallium nitride cap, so it's not so easy to do the simulation and get the correct leakage and to find out whether leakage is due to uh, tunneling or maybe to some trap assisted tunneling. That's important to evaluate the, the, to understand the leakage current through this uh, gate stack. So this is one of the topics. Again, very, a lot of interest from industry in this subject. Gallium nitride electronics for high power applications, both high frequency and just and, and consumer market on silicon uh, substrates. A different subject is uh, um, growth of uh, nanowires. Uh, this work is done by uh, Kobe Greenberg, John Talaro, and Sasha Kelly. Um, these are enium phosphide nanowires. Um, it's quite interesting that they grow in the vortite uh, crystalline structure. We can see here photoluminescence is, is at a different energy than the uh, zinc blend substrate, higher energy. We can easily see it's vortite. <coughs> it's not easy to grow these nanowires. We started this project four years ago and it turns out to be much more complicated than we actually initially uh, thought. This is a VLS cross method where we have gold particle on top of the nanowire, which is actually a catalyst for, for growth. Growth mechanism is very complex, not well understood, excellent subject for research. For application, the big question mark, but for research, very interesting. Uh, some TM pictures showing a pure vortex phase of the nanowires at certain temperature. At other temperatures, we see a mixed phase vortex uh, zinc blend uh, mixed phase at a uh, higher temperature. Actually, at a higher temperature, that's what's happening. Okay, this is the uh, metal organic molecular beam epitaxy system, MOMB, which we're using to grow the nanowires. It was used also to grow all the transistor structures I was describing before, and uh, laser structures, etc. Now most of the activity is on uh, nanowires. Shibon Cohen is doing work for many years operating this uh, complex system. And um, I have not mentioned before our work on gallium nitrides in collaboration, collaboration with the professor, professor Moshe Eisenberg from Material Science, a very good collaboration between Material Science and Electroengineering, very fruitful. This work is again in collaboration by a student supervised jointly by both of us, Igor Krilov, who's working on this material system, very popular material system of uh, inium gallium arsenide, some dielectric, high di dielectric and metal. It is one of the candidates for the um, beyond CMOS uh, technologies, so many groups working on this. Uh, there are several things that the Igor has discovered here, I'm just pointing out one of the uh, topics, it's the uh, out diffusion of indium from indium gallium arsenide into the aluminum dioxide. Uh, Igor actually discovered this, now many groups have uh, seen it and actually uh, working on this problem and trying to see wh whether the indium atom which are just diffused in, into the alumina, what kind of trouble they cause and uh, how this can be uh, eliminated. Igor actually showed that uh, gold here is a um, sink for indium atoms and it can solve some, some of the problem by ab absorbing most of the indium from coming out from the indium gallium arsenide into the alumina. That's all. A review of our group activity. I hope I was a little bit shorter so we have time, more time for lunch. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>